The Ballad of Johnny Arcane by Jim Nail, <coughs> read by Jim Nail. Chapter 5, Trouble in Stubblefield, Part 3. Young fellow turned from the cupboard, an armful of towels. Johnny placed his back to the table to conceal the note. Right this way, sir. The old man led him up a flight of creaky stairs and down a long, dark hallway. A cat disappeared into the shadows at their approach. The walls were stained with mildew and a threadbare runner of rotting wool clung to the floor. Young fellow shoved open the last door at the end of the hall. Here you are, sir. These are your towels. The bath will be warm if you let it run for a while. Is there anything I can get you? More wine, perhaps? Uh, no, no thank you, Johnny shook his head. I think I will just sleep. Very well, sir. The bed had an iron frame and stood directly under the window. Johnny knew at once which window because it was partially covered by ivy. He looked out on the mounded vineyards indistinct in the dark. He turned back to the room. <clears throat> A large clawfoot tub sat in the corner. He wondered how it could be filled up here on the second floor, far from any well or stove. Then he saw the pipes protruding from the floor and the small silver knob. He turned the knob and jumped back in surprise as the water gushed into the tub from the spout. Soon he found himself soaking in a tub of warm water, pondering the strange events of the day. He found nothing he could moor himself to. Superstition was everywhere. How could he ever distinguish the facts from the beliefs. Yes, he had learned the story of Borderbinder, how he sealed the four directions with cornmeal and ended the time of fire and bandits. And yes, he had listened to the tales around the campfires, believed by few, but often told that Borderbinder did not really die, that he had slipped into the side world where he had been transformed into a different kind of being, one that could pass through walls and barriers, one who would someday return to reopen the gates of the four directions. But this was childishness. Nobody really believed it, nobody except fools who lived out on the fringes and ate the flesh of lizards. Life would go on as usual. The four directions would stand and contain all their laws within them. But what if you were to go there? What if you were, were to walk north and north until you came to the cave from which flowed the source of the river only. And then you kept walking north. What would you find? How could it not be possible to keep going? What would stop you? He climbed from the bath and dried himself with young fellow's towel. He did not dress, but slipped into the bed naked, pulled the blankets up to his chin, and fell immediately asleep. He dreamt 
of Lucy. She was on a boat, on a river, the river only. He was on the shore, running along the shore, trying to keep up with the boat. Lucy was crying to him, Johnny, Johnny, stop them. They're going to take me back. At the helm of the dark, of the boat, a dark figure hunched, cloaked in black. It did not place a hand on the tiller, but seemed to steer the boat as if by magic. Just before the boat rounded a bend and disappeared from sight, the figure lifted its hood to reveal a helmet of antlers. Johnny woke with a start. It was icy cold and his body was shivering. A shadow was moving across the window. It was just the ivy lil lilting in the wind. Outside, a pale half-moon was rising through a quilt of clouds. He felt himself gripped by a fist of terror beyond his comprehension. The old house was creaking and breathing, and out in the hall he heard whispering voices. The door opened, and someone entered. She stood there at the center of the room. He recognized her at once. It was the red-haired vineyard girl from the dance. The moonlight lit her white tunic like phosphorescence. She looked around, adjusting her eyes to the dark. There you are, she cried. I thought you'd be there. She stamp scampered across the room, threw back the co covers, and jumped into the bed, then gasped at the touch of Johnny's naked skin. Oh, you're so cold. I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. Hold me, please. Hold me. Well, of course I'll hold you. That's what I came to do. Her voice was full of warmth. She pressed her body against his and threw her legs over his legs, her arms around his neck. Then she kissed him on the face, on the chest, and began to run her mouth down his belly. No, no. Don't do that. I can't do that. I belong to another. I'm just afraid. Hold me, that's all. Just hold me. I'm so afraid. Morning. Johnny sat at a big oak table in the castor bean kitchen, eating a bowl of porridge, while at a nearby desk the mayor made inky scratches on a piece of parchment with a feather quilt pen. Old man young fellow stood in the corner as still as a wooden statue. Earlier, when Johnny awoke, the red-haired girl was gone, and the morning sun was streaming in through the ivy-clad window. He heard the songs of the vineyard workers as they, as they moved through the fields, through the vines, I mean, and his mind was calm and still. Gone was both the fear and the elation of the night before. The day was a blank slate on which he would write. There, said the mayor, breaking his reverie. That should do it. Pan Clangbanger is a metal worker in the town of Sputum. Three days walk north along the river road. I've prepared you a map as well, but I've recompensed you nothing for your labors. On the contrary, said Johnny, last night was one I'll never forget. Castor Bean looked around the kitchen. There must be something, anything. Look around. From where you're sitting, anything you can see. From where you're st without standing, 
you can take with you on the journey. These words surprised him, for he had already been looking at something and thinking of what use he might make of it. He stood and walked to the counter where a flat metal container rested on the tiles. He picked it up, only as thick as a finger, and just wide enough and long enough to slip into his backpack. What do you use this for? he asked. Oh, that's nothing. I uh, put documents in it when I have to carry them from place to place. Keep them dry. It keeps them dry if it rains. I have several. Well, I'll take this one then. I think I can use it. Whatever suits your fancy, young arcane, you are a strange one. But I knew that when you came. And even more so, after you'd been here for a while. Here is your burden and your map. Tell my man, Clangbanger, that time is shorter than it is long. He'll know what I mean. He handed Johnny the message and the map. And the, map. the envelope was sealed with a red wax embossed with a letter C. We shall meet again, there is no doubt. The young fellow took one step forward. Your pap, sir, he said, and handed Johnny his backpack. For a moment he thought he saw a ripple pass across the old man's face like the surface of a lake in a breeze. Perhaps not. Perhaps it was only his imagination.